Turn to Revelations 21. And we're going to pick up where we left off last Sunday. I think we're into some exciting stuff. How about you? We started out last Sunday in verse 12, or actually finished up or ended in verse 12, talking about the city of God, which is the church, New Jerusalem, said, and had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 60, it tells us what the walls of the city are and what the gates are. In Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 18, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. I want to stop right there for a moment. How many know this church, this city of God, this city, New Jerusalem, that's coming down out of heaven upon the earth, which simply means it's coming out of the realm of invisibility into visibility. Heaven being that which is invisible, earth being that which is visible. Colossians 1.16 gives us that definition. definition. It says, For by him were all things made that are made, both in heaven and in earth, both visible and invisible. Heaven being the invisible, earth being the visible. And how many believe that's a clear definition? Heaven's not a geographical location. It isn't some place way up in the sky. But God uses the sky, the natural heavens, to illustrate how that heaven is a higher dimension than the natural, than the earth, than that which is seen. Scripture declares that his ways are higher than our ways. But how many know those of us that are beginning to hear the message of our identity, know who we are in Christ because of what Jesus has done for us, that our old man was crucified with him, that we're a new creature. All things have been made new. How many know that as we're learning our identity, his ways are becoming our ways. How many believe that? Our ways are becoming his ways. Because the Bible says we are citizens of heaven. doesn't say we're going to be citizens of heaven. It says we now are citizens of heaven. All oh, praise the Lord. We're learning that his ways are our ways. And my voice is going to get better as I preach. I declare that. But the city, New Jerusalem, as it actually is, has been an invisible thing to the world. A little bit of it has been visible. But let me tell you something. The church as a whole, has not expressed the nature and character of Christ. And this is what I like here in the scripture, where it says, Violence shall no more be heard in our land. Do you know the church is filled with violence? Starting in the dark ages, the church, as everybody recognized it, the Roman Catholic Church, the church that was started by the 12 apostles, I mean, that, that, that was where the uh, foundation was 
but then they begin to uh, they begin to not follow the spirit that was in the apostles, but just trace their natural, uh, could I say their spiritual genealogy back to the apostles. Well, you know, I was taught by so-and-so, who was taught by so-and-so, who was taught by so-and-so, who was discipled by one of the apostles. That's my lineage there. Well, that's great. But there was one of the deacons by the name of Nicholas, there in, in, in Acts, how many remember the seven deacons that were ordained because the apostles uh, could not take care of everything? They said, well, find us seven men full of the Holy Ghost, and we'll ordain them. Stephen was one of them. And how many remember the preaching of Stephen? But one of those men was a, a man by the name of Nicholas. And Nicholas, though he was taught by the apostles, he had his spiritual genealogy I don't know which one mentored him but he could trace his ordination but the apostles were the ones that ordained him they were under the right order well Nicholas began to draw disciples after himself and begin to depart from the truth because in 1 John John says there are many antichrists they were of us, but they're not of us, or they would have stayed with us. And so we see today, the Catholic Church can trace its genealogy back to the apostles, but I'm telling you, in that order, they departed from the spirit of revelation from the spirit of truth that was working in those original apostles. When Jesus said to Peter, remember Peter got a great revelation. Jesus asked him, who do men say I the son of man am? Peter said, well thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But Jesus never told him that. Jesus taught him. But he never at that point said, I am the Son of God. I am the Christ. He said, who do you say that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah. Come back. Or one of the other prophets. But he says, who do you say that I am? Peter, seeing all the things that Jesus did, I'm sure scriptures of the Old Testament come to his remembrance. And he said, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looked at him and he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father, which is from heaven, you got this by the Spirit. It isn't something that I taught you. It's a revelation that you got. By knowing me. Then Jesus said, and upon, he said, Thou, your name shall be called Peter, or Cephas, which meant rock. And he said, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now the rock that he was talking about was not Peter himself. Peter was a representative of that rock but it was a revelation that Peter got that Christ that Jesus was the Christ the son of the living God he was the rock and upon this rock Jesus will I build my church of course the Catholic Church says that Peter was the rock he was the first Pope he was ahead of the twelve. Well, when you read in the book of Acts, though Peter was one of the ruling apostles, it never does show him as the head of them all. He's one of the heads. There was rank even among the twelve. Remember, Jesus took three with him up to the Mount of Transfiguration. 
But nowhere did it ever show one that was above them all. You could see three of them maybe above them all at that, but never one. The one that's above all is Christ. It is the rock, the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. It is that revelation that is, a, that is the rock the church is built upon. But the Catholic Church declared it, it is Peter. It's funny, though. There was not a pope raised up in the church for over 100 years. Actually, for 300 years. It wasn't until Constantine, who was the... Uh, led a revolution and became the uh, ruler of Rome that he made Christianity the state religion of Rome and he became the head of the church later on that title was passed on in the 400's there was a uh, a council of bishops and they voted one bishop to be head of all the other bishops and he became a pope their system may have been built upon the apostles but it was not upon the revelation that they had because in later centuries they departed from the very foundation of salvation which is salvation by grace through faith built upon what Jesus himself did not upon our works not upon our rituals not upon any of those things but the Catholic Church became built upon works upon rituals I'm going somewhere with all this those who begin to get the revelation those who begin to see the truth of the Bible, which were a part of that system, when they begin to preach the truth that they had, all of a sudden the church came against them, and the church martyred them, put them to death. And the church has had a long, bloody history. For over a thousand years we call it the dark ages it was a bloody history of the Catholic Church killing and destroying those that they deemed as heretics those who were just preaching the revelation that God gave them because they began to see what the Bible was saying and what they were teaching were different but not you can't blame it all on the Catholic Church either because some of the movements that begin to come out of Catholicism who begin to uh, be the um, pillars of Protestantism some of them did the same thing there was a group of Lutherans who was not what Luther taught but they began to just be just as bad as the Catholic Church that they come out and they started destroying the Catholic churches, killing everyone that went there because they were the heretics. And we have seen that in the past, the church has had a bloody history. Can somebody say amen? You get to Salem, Massachusetts, and you have the witch trials in which the Puritans burnt witches or who they deemed witches at the stake maybe there were some genuine witches maybe some of those people were just different from them but how many know the New Testament is not the same as the Old Testament you see you remember two of the disciples were wanting to call fire down from heaven because well these aren't 
following us and they're casting demons out in your name. And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. That calling fire down from heaven and destroying people, that's old covenant. I'm the new covenant. You don't know what spirit you're of. Jesus said, I come to save that which is lost. Not to destroy it. So here we see the church has had a bloody history. We bring it down to our day. And though we don't see physical violence in the church, how many can see how we have maimed, destroyed, and killed our own by the words that have come out of our mouth? Somebody preaches something different from the denomination that they were in and instantly rumors are told about them. Many times those rumors aren't even true. But they don't want people following them so they will make up rumors about them. I remember a lady, one of my teachers in Bible school at uh, at the House of Prayer in Springfield, Missouri, Sister Opal Davis, uh, old-time Pentecostal lady. She was around when the uh, Pentecostal move first hit Springfield, one of the very early pioneers of the Assemblies of God. And how she found the House of Prayer Brother Bill had a five-minute broadcast every day, and she would listen to that broadcast, and she would ask people if they knew anything about it. Oh, you don't want to go to that church. They actually worship the devil. And that was a rumor. That's why, you know, everybody said to everyone down there, worship the devil. Well, Opal Davis, it kind of made her curious. She said, well, I want to go see you, see if people really worship the devil. And so she went to the church there. And she experienced the moving of the Spirit. She heard the truth of God. She seen it right out of the Bible. And she never quit coming back. And she became one of Brother Bill's teachers. She taught Pentecostal truths. But other people were scared away. Because of the words the people said. How many people have been condemned by the preachers and their misunderstanding in their delivery of Scripture? I was in a meeting one time in Illinois. I had went to pastor a church there, and uh, the uh, former pastor's wife and some people took me to another Pentecostal church where there was a meeting that night and they had brought this girl to be to see if she would be saved and she was wearing a kind of a mini skirt but it was all she had and I mean she's not a Christian at this point they're bringing her in hopes that she might come to know the Lord and the preacher back there, big old holiness preacher, made a big example of her. Went over and looked at her and said, Girl, would you cover them legs? You're distracting me. That was the last time. I don't know about now, but that, at that time, that was the last time she had set her foot in the church. She didn't know the Lord. She was coming there with the intent of maybe coming to know the Lord. And instead, she was made an example of. And I mean, it crushed her. And I'm telling you, if that man was where he was supposed to be, them legs would not have distracted him. 
Now, I'm telling you, I'm a man just like anyone else in here. I see a nice-looking pair of legs. I look at them. And if I allow my mind to go somewhere with it, I could, uh, that, that could happen. But I guarantee you when I'm preaching, when I'm under the anointing, when I'm in church, those things do not distract me. Now when I'm out there in the truck, they can distract me. And I might have to do something with you know. But I'm telling you when I'm busy, under the anointing, I am not distracted by that. I was in a church service one time. If I am telling this, you this story, you'll know who I'm talking about. But the, uh, the pastor of the church was going through his midlife crisis. And so he told his wife, I'm going to have an affair. So you be another woman. I thought it was kind of wise. She, understanding his need, dressed differently, did her hair differently, you know, where she was another woman as far as in appearance. And so she come to church in a short dress. However, she didn't know it was going to be as short as it was. When she seen it on the mannequin, it was a little bit longer in length. But on her, it did not fit her at the, that, that same length. It was a short, much shorter dress. She gave that dress away to another young lady, and it fit her fine. It wasn't, but on her... It was a it was a it was a mini skirt or a mini dress. Well, we're all up there involved in the praise service, in the worship service. And I'm right up there where she is. I never noticed. The pastor wanting to tease her about it, wanted me to say something to her, said but then, you know, he was kind of flabbergasted. I didn't notice. Hey, we were worshiping God. Now, after service, I might have noticed. But with our minds in God, you know, I'm concentrating on, on worship. So the, the problem in that meeting wasn't the girl with the mini skirt. It was the preacher. And all he was doing was just wanting to make an example, showing how straight laced of a of a holiness preacher he was. But where's the love of God? I guarantee you, once that girl would have come to know the Lord, she probably would have never wore that dress again. I remember pastor in the church that I did in Illinois there was a lady there that had been a part of that church but she had gotten away from the Lord gotten away from the church and she came to church wanting to get her life back right with the Lord but she wore but she had pants on and back in that day and we're talking about a move of God church, a kingdom church. But back in that day, the kingdom churches were still pretty Pentecostal. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Can somebody say amen? But back then, women did not wear pants to church. And some of them, they did not wear pants at all. They're supposed to be in a dress at all times. The bylaws of this particular church was that a woman could not be in the sanctuary during service with pants on. She had to have a decent dress. That was her dress code. Well, she comes to the altar to give her, to, to give her life to the Lord. 
And she talks to me. She says, you know, I know the dress code in this church is, is, is I should be wearing a dress, but I only have one dress. And I said, look, you get your heart right with God, and God will take care of the rest. I did not change the dress order of the church. I did not change any policies. I said, first things first, let's get your heart right. She gave her heart to the Lord, and every service she came to afterwards, she wore that one dress. There was no problem. But I was called before the board because I had changed the bylaws of the church. I did not change the bylaws. I just said, let's get your heart right first and let God take care of the rest. You know what? God took care of the rest. That's when I asked God, I said, God, what's wrong with these people? Now, I know sometimes we need to ask God what's wrong with ourselves, but, you know, sometimes what's wrong with these people? And God spoke to me. He said, they're afraid she's going to get away with something they can't get away with. It was true. They wore pants outside of the church. But, you know, they were under that old order. They couldn't wear pants to church. And some of them I know one and two. But that's what God said. They're afraid she's going to get away with something. They can't. You know, you got to tote the line. What am I saying? Because of these kind of things, We've seen violence in the church, haven't we? We might not see the violence that happened in the dark ages, but we're seeing violence out of the mouths of people who are coming against those that are different than them. Those that are don't measure up to what they think they should. But here's what it says. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Won't that be a glorious day? Amen. That day's today for us. If we'll heed the word of the Lord, we won't follow the example of the past. We will be different. Can somebody say amen? Yes. Now, we, won't, we believe in holiness. We believe in lives dedicated to the purpose of God, which is what holiness really is. And there is a certain dress. It isn't necessarily the style of clothing you're wearing, but how many know you need to be modestly dressed? But somebody that doesn't know the Lord, give them the space that God gave us. Give them the grace to change. You see... Holiness, without the, with not being balanced with the love of God, is an ungodly thing. Amen? It can be a cruel thing. God wants lives dedicated to Him, but He also wants us to love. And to show the same grace to others that God has given us. So violence shall no more be heard in thy land, Wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation. What are the walls of the city? Salvation. The way they built cities back in ancient times, you still see some of them today in the Middle East, but the way they built cities in ancient times, they, were, they always had walls. Because there was all, all, always warfare going on. Somebody would always be trying to besiege the city. Someone was always wanting to conquer someone else. How I many know things ain't changed much? Seemed like man's always wanting to conquer someone else. And because they were always conquering someone else, they built cities with walls so that the walls would protect them from those coming against them. Well, how many know... 
As Christians, we have a lot of things coming against us. But there are walls. If we put our trust in God, there are walls between us and the things that want to destroy us. And one of the things that wants to destroy us is sin. There is a wall between us and sin. Sometimes we may not take advantage of that wall. But the Bible says he will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able to bear. And with every temptation, he will make a way of escape. How many believe that? And if somebody says, well, you know, I'm just tempted above what I am able. No, you're not. Because if you were not able to bear it, God would not allow you to go through it. I know I've ex personally experienced that scripture. There was a time in my life when I was very vulnerable. Seemed like I would chase after temptation. But I always prayed that prayer. I said, God, put a wall around me. Keep me from sin. And it seemed like at the times I was the weakest and even would almost run after temptation... There was always a wall there keeping me from sin. Now there are other times that I ignored the way of escape. But how many know there's always a way of escape? Times when my anger would rise up and my tongue wanted to shoot off some words. But there was always a space somewhere where God would get my mind somewhere else where I could get out of that way of thinking. How many have experienced that? Now, there's times I have obeyed that, taken that escape, and overcome the temptation. Other times I ignored that escape and let my mouth shoot off words that had no reason that I shouldn't I had no reason of letting come out of my mouth. How many know what I'm talking about? But God will keep you from temptation. There are walls around this city, and the walls are called salvation. And I don't care what your problem is, honey, there are some walls there if you'll trust the Lord. Amen. And so those are the walls of the city. But they said, thy gates praise. Gates are entrances. You know how you enter into the presence of God? Praise. One scripture says in the Psalms, he inhabits the praises of Israel. How many know today we're the Israel of God? If we are born again and we are children of God, today we are the Israel of God. God inhabits our praises. And so the way you enter into the city is praise. Now praise for n number one, I know praise can be your singing. Praise can be your testimony. Anything that is lifting up the object that you're praising. But praise is first, recognition. Yes. You wouldn't be praising if you first didn't recognize. And why we praise Jesus is because we recognize what he has done for us. Amen. We recognize his, the, the example he lived. We recognize his supernatural birth into this world. We recognize his nature, his character of love, our example. We recognize his ultimate price. His death on Calvary's cross. Whereby he declares our old man was crucified with him. What we could not do for ourselves, he did for us. So the, all we got to do is recognize that and believe that 
and we can start experiencing that. Amen? Amen. That's praise. That's how you become a part of this city. That's how you become a, enter the city. Well, let's go back to Revelations 21. I'm going to try to move along today, get as much as I can get out. But it says, and it had a wall great and high, verse 12, and had 12 gates. Gates are praise, and at the gates, 12 angels. How many angels are messengers? Each gate, though it is praise, there's also a message on how you enter in and become a part of the city. And listen to what it goes on to say. It says, and the names written thereon. The message is in the names. Which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And in Revelations chapter 7, it gives us a listing of the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Now they're a little bit different here in Revelation 7 than they are when you read the order in Genesis. Because the message is not in the historical tribe, it's in the name of the tribe. How many know that we're not a part of the city, we're not a part of the people of God because we are flesh and blood descendants of the 12 tribes. Though most of us in here, maybe all of us in here, could trace our lineage to one of those 12 tribes. We're not redeemed. We don't enter into the kingdom by flesh and blood. Amen? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There is a spiritual application to these names. These names are the gates of the city. And starting in verse 5, these are the ceiling of the tribes. I'll start in verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now all 144,000 is, is 12 times 12,000. And remember, the walls of the city were 12,000 furlongs. Amen? They were 12,000 furlongs wide, 12,000 furlongs long, 12,000 furlongs high. If you break, that's why this is not a natural city. And it said, they're all equal. They're all equal. Well, the size of the city, it was 12. Now, the thickness, that's the only thing left. The thickness of the wall had to be the 144 cubits. We'll get into that a little bit later. Because the wall is 144 cubits, which again is 12 times 12. 12 being the number of divine order, 12 being the number of God's government. It is God's divine order multiplied in a people. The church started out, the foundation of the church was 12 apostles. But as the church develops, that government is multiplied. And it has nothing to do with a natural number. It just means the authority that those 12 men had and the order that they established is going to be multiplied. See, 12 times 12, it's, it's a multiple of itself. Today, the government of God isn't going to be 12 men 
it's going to be that same ministry and authority multiplied in a large group of people. Aren't you glad? And that's what he's called us to. But let me get into the tribes and the names of the tribes. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. The word Judah means praise. The first thing that's going to cause you to enter the city is praise, recognition, recognition of Jesus. Amen. The second here is Reuben. Reuben means behold a son. Reuben was actually the firstborn of the children of Israel. He was the firstborn son. It was Reuben that saved Joseph, if you remember the story. Remember Joseph was sold, well, they wanted to kill Joseph. Well, Reuben said, look, why don't we just sell him as a slave? In fact, Reuben went and checked on him, but it was too late when he did. Reuben was the one that wanted to save Joseph's life. But Reuben means behold a son. The, the only way you can become a part of this city is you've got to be a born into the city. You must be born again. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. You must be born again. You don't come, you don't become a part of the family of God because, you know, this is a good group of people. I think I'll just start going there. That gets you in the door. But if that's all you've progressed, you're just an observer. Amen? You're not a part of the city, but it's when you hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, the word of God is the seed of God. When you start believing the word of God, the word of God then is seed that is implanted into your hearts, into the womb of your mind. And that seed begins to reproduce itself. And how many each kind brings forth after its own kind. And what God is, is what we become. That's what the city of God is. The city of God is the habitation of God. Oh, hallelujah. You see, Jesus, though he never called himself God, did call himself the Son of God and the Son of Man. Now, at the time he was talking to Peter, he had not yet made that proclamation. That was Peter's revelation. Amen? But there are many places in Scripture where Jesus did identify himself as the Son of God. And in John chapter 8 is one of them. And if you remember the story, the Jews sought to kill him because they said, you make yourself out to be God. Do you realize if you call yourself a son of God or even a child of God, you're making yourself out to be God? Each kind brings forth after its own kind. They understood that. So all Jesus had to say is, I'm the son of God. And immediately to them, he's saying he's God. Because they understand each kind brings forth after its own kind. See, we were born into this world, flesh. Amen? When we were born of the spirit, we became spirit. And what is God? Spirit. His nature ultimately is our nature. How many know we're changing because that seed that came into us from the Word of God is causing us to become like Him? We're finding ourselves with a new identity. We're acting different than the way we once did. 
Oh, praise the Lord. Of course, another thing Jesus said was, before Abraham was, I am. And uh, that kind of riled them up. What I'm trying to say is, the only way you can become a part of the city of God is you got to be born again. you got to become a son. Behold a son. And if you're a son, you're like your father. Ain't that neat? Oh, hallelujah. There's a lot of religious people. But they ain't a part of the city. Because they ain't really born again. If you're born again, it's because you have believed the word of God and that seed is reproducing the life of God in you. Oh, hallelujah. The next tribe. I'm just going to read these down. You, you can read them there in Revelation 7. You have Judah because you first have to recognize Jesus. Amen. You have Reuben because you must be born again. You must be born as a child of God. Then you have Gad, and Gad means a troop, a troop, an army. You know what an army has? Rank, order, every soldier has his job and has his ranking. So that this army becomes one. And the only way we learn our ranking, and the only way we can be put together as an army, is we must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, even the more so as you see the day approaching. Amen. An army, for one, is an assembly. They're not a bunch of individuals going out to fight a battle with no structure. If you have a bunch of individuals going out with no structure against, against an army, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be annihilated. You must be, you must assemble yourselves together you must work together. You must be an army. Amen. There are no lone rangers in the city of God. I know it's quiet in here. But how many lone rangers have we had in the kingdom? And let me tell you something. Most of those lone rangers that do not believe in assembling themselves together in a regular assembly, the only reason they don't is because they're not the ones that are pastor in the church or they're not the one that's recognized. If they were recognized, they would probably be the biggest tyrants around. Bless God, I'm the man of God. You must, you must listen to everything I got to say. You must do whatever I tell you because if you don't, you're disobeying God. But because they're not recognized, well, bless God, I've got just as much truth as they got. I've got just as much anointing as they got. Why well, I under? I got revelation. So they're lone rangers trying to find anybody they can to listen to them. And it's funny, all these lone rangers that don't believe in the church want to come to your church and preach. They don't want no responsibility for building the church. They don't want no responsibility for supporting the church. And they want to come and tell you that the day of the church is over, but they want to come to your church to preach it. There are no lone rangers in the city of God. 
Amen. We are an army. The next tribe is Asher. Oh, I like this. You know what Asher means? Happy. Happy. It is those that walk in the joy of the Lord. I'm telling you, there are no sad sacks on their way to Baghdad in the city of New Jerusalem. If you're a sad sack on your way to Baghdad, then you need to get, on, get your way on down to Baghdad. No room for gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. There's no misery in the city of God. Oh, hallelujah. Now we, as was said in the service already, we experience some things that we don't like. Sometimes we have to go through some things. But the joy of the Lord should always be there. Well, the joy of the Lord's our strength. How you enter in the city and become a part of the city. Recognition, praise. Being born again, becoming a son. Becoming a part of the army of God. Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together. Allowing yourself to be submitted to the rank and order that God is establishing. No, not being a lone ranger. And two, you got to be happy. You got to have the joy of the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. You enter in. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Joy of the Lord. Then you have Naphtali. Naphtali means my wrestling. Now some say, well, you know, that's wrestling with all those old thoughts and you know that we that we all used to wrestle with or maybe still be wrestling with. No, it's the wrestling is accepting our identity. All those other thoughts are trying to lie to us and tell us we're not what God says. And and, and a lot of the church world don't want to say they are who God says they are because they see all these things that are uh, that are contrary. We, by faith, God, to declare who we are in the midst of those things. My example for this wrestling is Jacob. How many remember when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord? In fact, he said it was God that he wrestled with. He said he named the place Peniel for he said, I have seen God and lived. Peniel. I guess that's the proper pronunciation for it. Close enough. But it's there. Jacob was having to return back. And he knew he had to face Esau. And he knew he had done Esau wrong. Now God had, God had called Jacob to have the blessing. But the way Jacob got the blessing was still nonetheless wrong. When, J, when, when, when Esau come to Jacob hungry, what was, what was Jacob supposed to do? Be his brother's keeper or strike a bargain with him? Oh, you want... Haven't been successful hunting? Don't have no food? Hungry? Coming to your old brother Jacob for some food, huh? Well, what about that birthright? What about that birthright? Well, Esau's hungry. At that time, he don't care about the birthright. What's his birthright to me? Give me some of that stew you got there. So that, that was the first place Jacob did wrong. Second place, and I know he was coached by his mother, but honey, we all stand before God on what we know to be right. Amen. We don't blame, 
Well, you know, this was my mother's idea. Jacob knew what his mother was coaching him to do was wrong. Now, God used it. But how many know God? Jacob would have been the one anyway. That was God's, God chose Jacob. Some way God would have worked it out. This is just how it got worked out. Thank God. This is where that scripture, all things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But that doesn't mean the thing that you're doing is right. All things aren't good. All things will work together for your good if you have the right attitude. If you learn by what you're going through. All things do not work for the good of all people. Only those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Jacob loved God and was called according to his purpose. Even the wrong that he did, though he was coached in, it worked together for good. That didn't mean what he did was right. and That doesn't mean that he didn't have to pay for it. How many know he paid for it? He connived Esau. He connived Isaac. What happened to Jacob when he went over and uh, to his, uh, his 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 uncle Laban? He what whatsoever a man soweth that shall he reap. He got it back. Le, le, he didn't get the woman he loved. He got Leah. Then he had to work seven more years to get Rachel. That wasn't the end of it. There was a whole deal with the cattle and everything. Man, Laban tried to put the screws to him every way he could. But God turned it around for good for Jacob. Nevertheless, Jacob's on his way to meet Esau. And Jacob knows he'd done Esau wrong. Jacob has to face what he has done. I'm telling you, God forgives us of our sin. But the outcome, what was produced by our sin, we got to face. See, that's something a lot of people don't understand about the grace of God. Yes, the grace of God is there to forgive you. And the grace, of, the favor of God is there. But honey, you, if you've done some things wrong, you got to make them right. And, that, and Jacob was an example of that. So what Jacob did is he sent the whole crew before him. He was going to give Esau at least half of what he owned, <coughs> if, not, if not more. Esau, God had worked on him. Esau was a wealthy man, and God had blessed him. So Esau didn't want what Jacob had. But Jacob stayed behind, and there he wrestled with God. The angel of the Lord. Could I say the message of God? Because a message came to Jacob, saying, Thou art no longer Jacob. You have been, the word Jacob meaning supplanter, manipulator deceiver because remember what he did to Isaac he went in coached by his mother dressed up like Esau had hides on his arm you know because Esau was a hairy man and Jacob was a uh, smooth man Jacob was one that used Burma shave He was a smoother rooster. <clears throat> but he went in and deceived his father. And, and, and Isaac, you feel like Esau. You smell like Esau. But your voice sounds like Jacob. But nevertheless, he got the blessing. Well, now, Jacob is facing God. And there's been a change in Jacob's heart. 
having experienced all that he did through Laban. And Jacob's heart was always after God. And God said, Thou art no longer Jacob. You're no longer a deceiver, a manipulator, a conniver. But you are a prince who has power with God. That's what the word Israel means. Thy name is Israel. And he says, spells it out there, for thou are a prince who has power with God. And you know why he was told that? Because he wrestled with the angel and he said, I will not let you go till you bless me. I'm telling you, when we hear the message of our identity and we see the things that are still wrong in our lives, we wrestle with that. Amen? Yes. We wrestle with that. Well, you know, I, I know this is what God says I'm, I am and I know this is what I'm going to be, but you know, right now, that's not what I am. Honey, are you going to go by sight or are you going to go by faith? And it's a wrestling match. Amen. How many how many believe it's a wrestling match? Church world today is still wrestling because they don't think we can be like God. And God says we're already like Him. It's in us. It may not be coming out of us, but it's in us. But honey, it's, it's going to be coming out of us. And so as Jacob said, I will not let you go. See, so many people will just let go of the message. Even though he wrestled, he said, I'm not going to let you go. Don't you know when you wrestle with God, that can be a rough wrestling match. You ain't wrestling with Hulk Hogan. You're not wrestling with with. with, with Whoever the wrestler is today, you're wrestling with God. He knows some moves Hulk Hogan don't know. Amen. Amen. But nevertheless, Jacob knew the message is true. He is a prince who has power with God. He said, I'll not let you go till you bless me. And he was blessed. His name was changed. So we might wrestle with who God says we are, but if we'll not let go, if we'll not let go, if we'll not let go, we're going to come through victorious and we're going to be everything He says we are. My wrestling, that is how you become a part of this city. And a part of that wrestling is learning to listen when the voice of God brings His Word back to your remembrance. Willing not to just go by what you've been taught, but to actually search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And become honest with the Word of God. When you are, how many know you're going to prevail as that new creature? You're going to be that glorious city. Oh, praise the Lord. Then the next tribe is Manasseh. Oh, I love this one. You know what Manasseh means? Causing to forget. Causing to forget. Honey, I know we've made some messes in the past. How many, how many would, would, would acknowledge we've made some messes in the past? And there are things that we regret. But it doesn't change who He says we are. And if we'll trust God, He'll cause us to forget those things behind us. As Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind me, I press forward to the mark of the high for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I've done some things wrong. People have done wrong to me. I've had a lot of situations, but you know, 
Today, I don't remember them. Oh, I can think of the situation, but they, 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 they don't bother me. I think about things as they are right now. Praise the Lord. You can't be a part of the city if you're remembering every bad thing somebody's done to you. You can't become a part of the city if you're remembering all the bad that you've done. You've got to forget those things that are behind you. You're a new creature now. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. When you can learn to forget those things that are behind you, you can come through this next gate, Simeon. Simeon means hearing. You cannot hear from the Lord if you're dragging the past up all the time. Can somebody say amen? You can't hear from the Lord while you're still in a wrestling match. The wrestling's got to end. Hearing. And you can't be a part of the city of God if you can't hear from God. We need to hear from God. Amen. You can't enter into and become a part of the city without hearing his voice. My sheep hear my voice and another they'll not hear. They'll not follow. Then you come to the next gate. Let me tell you what that would mean. Next one. Well, in an indirect way, the word Levi means attached. Joined. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Levi was a priesthood. As a priesthood, they were to be attached to God. Because to man, they represented God. To God, they represented man. That's what a priesthood is. But the word is attached. To be joined. If you're joined to the Lord, you are one spirit. And in that, you're a protector. In that, you're a provider. In that, you're everything he is. Because you're attached to him. Oh, hallelujah. We're one with him. Amen. You can't be a part of the city of God if you're not one with God. Jesus prayed, Father, make them one as we are one. Oh, praise the Lord. Then you have Issachar. He will bring a reward. How many like to receive a reward? I'll tell you, when you can hear God, and when you're attached to Him, and you forget those things that are behind you, there is a reward. You know what the reward is? It's the prize. The high calling of God. Oh, hallelujah. My reward is, a, is in a cabin in the corner of glory land. There ain't no big mansion next to Jesus's either. I'm his mansion, his dwelling place. Oh, hallelujah. But I have a reward. His reward is his presence. His reward is a, the prize for the high calling of God to be conformed to his image. Oh, praise the Lord. The next one is Zebulun. Oh, this is great. You know what Zebulun means? A habitation. We become the habitation of God. But you know what's great about that? God then becomes our habitation. He lives in us, but we live in him. Oh, hallelujah. That's what being a part of this city means, to be a habitation of God and for God to be our habitation. Then the next one is Joseph. Now, first of all, you'll notice Ephraim is not mentioned. 
There are two half tribes of Israel, Manasseh and Ephraim. But how many know Ephraim is the firstborn and Manasseh was the nextborn? So Joseph, what Ephraim uh, got was Joseph's portion. And this and because this is spiritual and not physical, he uses Joseph's name because how many know the word Joseph means let him add. Let him add. Add. How many know God A A D D? Like two plus two is four. How many know when you be when you become a habitation of God and God is your habitation, He's going to add to you. <clears throat> and not just physical stuff. More importantly, He's going to add to you His abilities. He's going to add to you people. Amen? He's going to add to you people. How many want to see some people get a hold of this revelation. Oh, praise the Lord. Whatever you need of, He's going to add. And then the last one. Benjamin. Son of the right hand. This is the one who's seated at the right hand of God. Well, I thought that's Jesus. It is Jesus. How many know we are dead and our life is hid with Christ and God? If we are in Christ, it isn't just Jesus as a singular person at the right hand of God, but he has elevated us to sit at the right hand of God. We're not talking about a big throne room, a natural setting we're talking about that place of position and authority yes. and that place where it was said to Jesus or where Jesus said all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me in Christ that same position is given to us oh hallelujah the city of God is going to be the ruling part of this world. Oh, hallelujah. The ruling part of this world. That's been invisible. But how many can see it's coming into visibility. Well, back to Revelations 21, and I'm going to find a stopping place. How many have gotten something out of this this morning? Back in Revelations 12, it says, And he had a wall, great and high, and twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. They are the gates. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. Meaning there is, you can enter this city from wherever you are. Aren't you glad? You don't have to go to some certain geographical location. But wherever you are in life, you can become a part of this city. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now I'm going to make this short. I would not studied the names of the apostles. I don't think that's the importance of this message. It is understanding that our foundation has been brought to us by the apostles that God has raised up. And if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Oh. 
I'm going to start reading in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Turn on never say, we're the city. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The prophets he was talking about are the prophets of the Old Testament. The prophesied of the coming of Christ. The prophesied how he would be, what he would do, what he would establish. How many know the Old Testament is the New Testament veiled? By the Spirit of God, how many know the Old Covenant unveils the New Covenant? Jesus is said in Psalms 40, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O God. The book is all about Jesus. Amen? And it's all about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, those in Jesus, those in Jesus' day and in the days of the apostles, that religious order, all they could see was the law. All they could see was the ritual. All they could see is what they perceived was going to happen. Remember, Jesus said this. He said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they that testify of me. The book is about Jesus, and it's about Christ in you, the hope of glory. The foundation of this teaching come to us through the apostles. Amen? That's what they taught. And Paul, more exceeding than them all. Well, let me continue to read here. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. There's, your, there's Zebulun again, amen? A habitation of God. Well, praise the Lord. Let me go back to Revelations 21. The names, the gates, are the names of the children of Israel. The foundations is the teachings of the apostles. Verse 15. And he that talked 